Well, good morning, church. Again, as Allison said, my name is Seth, and I am just so thankful to be here. You know, this, this morning, just a quick few things about me, actually. As Allison said, uh, you know, I'm married to this, my wife, Emma, now. We've been married for almost a year, and I can confidently tell you, after a year of marriage, I know everything there is to know about marriage, and I do it perfectly the entire way through. Just, just don't ask her. But... And almost, almost kind of parallel to that, I've been working here for almost a year, and, and it's been a blessing to be on the staff. And, and similarly, you know, just, just like I've, I'm, I'm perfect at doing marriage, uh, I actually know nothing about my job, um, or really what I'm doing. And so, but, but this, you know, guys, I'm, I'm so blessed to be here, so blessed to be on the staff with a team of just individuals who just go after Jesus. And it's been a huge honor. And, and when they approached me about this, it was just so kind of them because to put a 22-year-old up on stage teaching is a huge risk. And you don't fully know what I'm going to say. You know, we do a run-through, but I could go rogue at any point. So, so but seriously. <laughs> but guys, I, it's seriously, I, I carry this with a lot of weight, and there's a lot of responsibility, and, and I please know I've spent a lot of time in preparation, and I am so thankful to be here with you all this morning, bringing the word, and I hope that this message, that, that what we're talking about with Jesus really lands and makes sense this morning. So this morning, we're actually talking about, we've been going through this series called Jesus Is. And, and in this series, we talked about Jesus being my friend and, and like we are who he says I am. And, and this week, we're talking about how Jesus is my safe place. Now, obviously this weekend, we've gone through a lot and, and my heart just aches for the families. You know, on Friday and Saturday, just going out and helping those that the trees have fallen down, their homes are smashed, you know, all the different, losing power, losing water, losing AC, all the different things. And this morning, it's really interesting, as I've been preparing for this message, I, I hope you know I haven't changed anything, but to, today we're actually talking a lot about storms. And the whole premise of the message is about storms. And so I texted Scott on Friday, was like, hey, Scott, don't know if it'd be insensitive or what I need to change, but I'm, I'm a little nervous talking about storms given the events that have just occurred. And he was like, no, actually, I think this would be a good idea because it's pretty on the nose as to what our people have been experiencing. But I want to be super clear. Jesus being my safe place does not mean that he just removes us. He doesn't just say, hey, I see you struggling. Hey, I'm just going to pluck you out and I'm going to place you over here. Like, no, no, no. Jesus, he doesn't take us to a safe place. He is our safe place. He doesn't, draw, he doesn't pick us up and drop us somewhere else and say, hey, now you're safe. He says, hey, I'm going to step into this with you, and I'm going to become what you need me to be, and that is your safe place. Now, when the storm hit, what did we all do? Like, when, when storms come, when the storm hit on Thursday, what did we do? We sought safety, right? We went to a safe place. Odds are we went into our homes, or we found somewhere that, that was safe. We sought shelter, we seek safety when the storms are just barreling through. And I mean, we don't usually try, I mean, some of us maybe try to outrun the storm, but, but we usually don't try to outrun the storm. We, we hunker down, we find our safe place, and that's where we stay. And, and, but you know, weather, weather's not predictable. As much as we want it to be, as much as we can check our, check our phones, we can watch the news, we can do all these things, weather isn't completely predictable. And oftentimes, we need to be prepared. But in, in all storms, we can't always be perfectly prepared. We try to be the best that we can. Make sure, we make sure we go to H-E-B and we grab some water and some food. And, and then you go there an hour later and everything's gone. For some reason, toilet paper is the first thing always to go. But <laughs> and we know how awful it is to not have toilet paper in those moments. But, but when the storms come, like, like we're not ready for them. Sometimes we're not prepared. But, but I wonder, because the storms come barreling in, the storms are raging, we need to go seek safety. I wonder how the same can be true with the rest of our lives. I mean, this weekend, we had a literal storm come raging through, and the storm came barreling, and it, and it, and it destroyed homes, and now we're left. Like, what do we do? Our marriages, it's, it's on the rocks. We're constantly arguing, and, and we're trying to figure it out, but, but nothing seems, there seems to be no solution. Finances, I mean, I mean they're, they're really, they're really coming, just coming down on us, and we, we don't know how to handle it. We don't know how we're going to make the next bill, how we're going to make the next payment. And we're just going, God, what do I do? Our kids, you know, we try to have these conversations, and it seems like no matter how hard I'm trying, no matter the wisdom I'm giving, no matter the advice I'm giving, they just don't seem to listen, and they're making decisions I can't even control. What do I do when life when life is just falling apart, when life is just completely falling to pieces and we just begin to grasp at whatever we can, what do we do? 
we seek safety. You see, I believe that that Jesus is our safe place. I believe that Jesus steps into these storms of our lives, steps into the storms and becomes that safe place for us. And I believe that's true because we're gonna find that in Daniel chapter three. But I just wanna give you all some context. Daniel chapter three, uh, leading up to this Daniel, he's a prophet. But Judah had been, had been captured or besieged by Babylon. And there was this king, his king it was King Nebuchadnezzar, or according to the Veggie Tales, he was, king, he was Mr. Nezer. That's how, I, that's, that's how I prepared for this. I just watched Veggie Tales and it got me ready. So, so there's this king and, and he decides to take the royal family, like the nobility of, of Judah, and he begins to assimilate them into Babylonian culture. He begins to kind of crush their identity as, as Israelites, as God's chosen people. And after three years of service, they were to join, after three years of training, they were to join into the king's service. And there were these three men, actually four, it was Daniel, and then it was his three friends, uh, uh, Oh, there it goes, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. But the king changes their names, right? Because their, king, their names meant things about God's character, but it begins to change. And they go to the names. It says, Daniel, the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to, Meshach, or to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But again, if you were a VeggieTales kid, it was Rack, Shack, and Benny. <laughs> Rack, Shack, and Benny are the, are the names of these three men. So God used, he actually gave them this wisdom. He gave them this knowledge that above a lot of other people, and he even gave Daniel the, the ability to interpret dreams. He gave Daniel the ability to interpret these dreams. And so the king has this horrible dream, this nightmare, and he goes to the, the Chaldeans, the astrologers, the, the, the guys that can do magic, and he's like, hey, interpret this. They're like, hey, we can't, it's impossible. They hear about this Daniel guy, they bring Daniel in, Daniel interprets the dream. And now, now just through this, through, God, through Daniel and then these three men's unwavering faithfulness, God promotes them through, through, through the king. So now they're in this kind of high level of leadership. And then we have this, we have Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, he, he builds this big golden statue. It's about 90 feet. It's, it's bigger than the White House. So this is like a big, big gold statue. And he makes this decree. He said, hey, whenever we play this music, bagpipe, bagpipe lyre, Eddie, he lists like 25 instruments. But whenever we play any kind of this music, you are to bow down to this idol. And then he says, and the punishment for not bowing down is death by a fiery furnace. So this is a, this is a no joke decree, like King stamped it. This is what's happening. And this is where we pick up in Daniel 3, verse 8. I'm going to begin reading. It says, Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews... Whom you've appointed, now this is the malicious, malicious accusing. There are certain Jews whom you've appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. See, these Chaldeans, again, the, the astrologers, the guys that were initially asked to interpret the dream, couldn't. But then Daniel and these three men show up and they can. And now they've been promoted past them and now they're upset. They're ticked off. They're like, man. Well, it's time to get our get back. Like, it's time to get these guys. So, so they go to the king, like, hey, king, I don't, I don't know if you heard, but there's, this, there's these guys, they're not actually obeying you. And then verse 13, it says, And Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up. Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And this is like, this is really cool of the king. So all these people are gathered around this statue. They're ready, they're bowing down, and, and they, they hear about, the king hears about this. He pulls the three men forward and is like, hey guys, you must not have heard the decree. You must not have heard the, the thing that I, that I just sent out, the news, that the, the pigeon might not have gotten to you yet, but I set this decree, if you don't worship, you know, you're gonna die, so I'm gonna give you a second chance in front of everyone. I'm giving you a second chance. I mean, this is pretty gracious of the king, gives him another chance, but here's how the king ends that verse. It says, and who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? 
Who is the God who's going to deliver you out of my hands? The king believed he was so powerful. The king believed he was so mighty that he said, there is not even a God who can deliver you out of my hands. That's who I am. There's not even a God who can deliver you. And then verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to them, and I love their response. It says, and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. This, if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the, from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hands, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. I mean, a slap to the face by these three men. Like, like they, they're saying, King, I don't even need a second to think about it. I know my answer. I know what I'm going to do. I'm not going to bow down because I believe God is going to deliver me. And if he doesn't, God's still good. Even if he doesn't deliver me, God is still good. But I believe he will. And the king, I mean, I mean he's got to be so embarrassed, right? He's in front of all these people like, hey, I'm going to give you another chance. Go ahead and bow And they're like, hey, king, not going to. And I just imagine him getting red in the face, getting super angry, just like, are you kidding me? I give you this chance in front of everyone. You're a Jew, like you're not even one of our people. I've raised you up in status and you're gonna embarrass me in front of everyone. How dare you? But I believe that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they they point to something that is super crucial. And this is our first point this morning, if you're writing it down. We need to be prepared for the storms. We have to be prepared for the storms. You see these life-threatening storms come through and they, just, and they just become hitting and they hit and they hit and they hit and they hit. But I believe that we can be prepared. You know, there's, there's certain state, like in, in different parts of the country, there's, there's, there's shelters that are specific to like tornadoes when they come in because they know, hey, we know how tornadoes hit. Like we're ready for a tornado. You know, hey, hurricanes are coming through. Like we know how to prepare for hurricanes. So we have hurricane shutters. That's why we have these, these shelters specifically. Like, like we know how to prepare for storms. But when it comes to the storms of our lives, oftentimes we're not prepared. We don't know what to do when it comes through. But I believe that they point to what is so important. And the first part is, is the word of God is essential to preparation. The word of God is absolutely essential to preparation. We have the living and breathing word of God that he has gifted to us. He's gifted to us. Jesus quoted it over 180 times in the New Testament. Like like the, the Bible is so crucial to our preparation. It would have been custom for the Jews to have memorized and to know the scripture by heart. Like they know it. They know the scriptures because they believe, man, it's everything God's given us. It is the firm, we just sang about it, the firm foundation on which I stand. Ephesians 6, 13, it literally says, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. And in case you guys didn't know, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. So we wanna go attack the enemy. We wanna be prepared for the storms. We need to be ready with the sword of, of the spirit. We have to put on the whole armor of God. And so we have the word of God. That's how we prepare, as well as we have to be in real community. We have to be in real relationships. So this this weekend, I went to a home, and one of the homes, a tree had fallen down, and and it it just, it was a mess. And the night, the night that it happened, on Thursday night, just tons of people came running to this home, put tarps down, did all the stuff. And I'm just going, church, can you imagine, like, if no one shows up, how do they handle that? If, no, if the community isn't rallying around these families, what do we do? Because when a storm comes through like that and knocks out and the tree comes over and lands on our home, like, man, odds are we're going to reach out to our small group. Hey, guys, I need help. I can't do this by myself. I can't fix my home. I can't put the tarps up. Like, like I'm by myself right now. I need you guys. But when the storms of life are raging through, for some reason, small group's the first one to go. Our friendships are the first ones to go. We let go of our community because our life is so busy or so consumed in what's going on that that we even forget to reach out to those that know us and those that love us. Community gets to step into the storms with us and continue to help us prepare. We've got to be prepared for the storms. Let's keep reading. In verse 19, it says, the Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury. You just remember, he's angry, he's embarrassed, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Again, the king gave him another chance. 
But verse, it continues. He ordered the, the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. So he's, he's mad. He's like, guys, make it hotter than it's ever been hot before. Like, make it super hot. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments. And they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated. The flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were fell bound into the burning fiery furnace. These three men, in total faith to the Lord, they were bound up by the mighty men of Babylon, not just any men, the mighty men. The furnace was so hot that the mighty men died, but they, found, they fall bound into this burning fiery furnace. So it's not even like they're free and they can quickly like escape it. Like, no, they're falling in completely unable to do anything. But then it continues. Verse 24, then, then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. And he answered them and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And then he says this, and the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. These men were bound by mighty men. They fall inbound and yet they stand up walking around in the fire. There's a fourth in the fire with them that wasn't there when they put him in. And he has the face, he looks like the son of the gods. And they're not even hurt. They're not even singed. I want to keep reading it. It's a, it's a bigger chunk right here. So keep, just keep, stick with me. It says, And Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. So they come out of the fire. It says, then, then uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go come out of the fire and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the body of these men. The hair on their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had even come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, blessed be the God. This is how the king changes his tune. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their house laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. This king, he just, he just was saying, like, like who's going to deliver you? I'm, I'm the king. Like, I'm the king of Babylon. Like, no one can touch me. Like, no one can, 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 is as strong than me, is more powerful than me. And then, then at the end, he makes this decree. He is the only God who can rescue them in this way. And this is where we get to our next point. Our stories become, or sorry, our storms become our stories, the share of God's goodness. Our storms become the stories of God's goodness. See, there's stories all throughout Scripture of these storms that are, that are coming through and God just shows up. That's why we even have them in there because we get to look at them and go, wow, look at, how God, look at how God pulled through. Even when it seemed like he wouldn't, even when they're facing the fire, they're staring fire in the face, it's super hot, it's, 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 it's right here. They walk in and they walk out unharmed, unsinged. They don't even smell like fire. That's how much God showed up. But this is not the only story in Scripture. I mean, I mean, we look at just all the times that God has shown up. We look at all the times. We, we see, we see in, in this story how God shows up in the furnace. And then we see Daniel very shortly after. He gets thrown into the den. God delivers him, but he was still in the den all night. He still had to be in the den. Then we see, then we see someone like Mary and Joseph. Like, like they gave birth to the Son of God, but yet they still faced the social torment, the rejection. Mary had to deal with Joseph not believing her initially. Jesus, he calls these disciples, and while it's like, man, this is Jesus, of course you'd follow him. They had to leave everything behind. They had to leave their livelihood, everything they knew. And then we, we continue, Peter, he's literally in an actual storm. The storm is, is insane. They're thinking they're going to die. Peter's in the storm. He sees through the storm, there's this man standing on water. And the man calls him out. It turns out it's Jesus. Peter begins to walk on the water. But guess what? When he looks at the storms, he begins to drown. And then Jesus, in the only the way that he can, comes up to him and grabs him and pulls him out of the water. 
See, these storms, they come through constantly, but Jesus, he steps into the storms. He doesn't just pull us out. He doesn't just take us away from it, but he steps into our storms. He steps into them. And we have to allow Jesus to be able to do that. We have to allow Jesus to become our safe place. And, and so we have all these really cool stories, right? We have all these awesome stories of how Jesus shows up, how he just shows up in these miraculous ways. But then guess what? When then we have the pinnacle of our faith, where God, he sees us in our sin, doesn't just say, hey, you're done. Like, you don't need to sin anymore. I've redeemed you. He sends his one and only son into the earth. His son then lives a perfect life on the earth, struggling, people persecuting him, treating him horribly. And then just the icing on that cake, he takes the criminal's death on the cross. He takes our place on the cross. He's the only person that doesn't deserve it. And yet he takes on the penalty of sin, which is death, and he dies the death for us. He stepped into our broken world, lived life among us, was with us, went to the cross, died, was resurrected, lived among us, and then he ascended, and then guess what? He sends the Holy Spirit, who's our forever safe place. He sends the Holy Spirit down. Church, we cannot appreciate a safe place until our storm has reached us. We can't even appreciate the safe places until our storms have reached us. We can't, like, we can't even appreciate it because you think about it, like maybe you get, who here has ever gotten really sick and, and you're really congested and you can't even breathe out of your nose, right? Like you can't breathe out of your nose. Well, we, oftentimes the moment that happens, you're like, oh man, I wish I could breathe through my nose again. <laughs> man, if, I, if the moment I can breathe through my nose, I'm gonna be so appreciative. I'm gonna be so grateful I can breathe. And then the moment comes, you're appreciative for like 15 minutes until you're sick again. And then you're like, oh, I wish I would have appreciated it more when I had the chance. Guys, we can't even appreciate the shelter. We can't appreciate the safe place that Jesus is until the storms have reached us. And then we go, oh my goodness, thank you. You showed up when I needed you. We have to stop treating God as a lifeguard. The moment, you know, when, when we're swimming, it's like, man, lifeguards aren't even important. Like, they're, they're just standing on their thing. They're chilling up there with their red, you don't even know what that is. You're standing there, you're, they're sitting up there with it. But yet, they, they, we only call for them when we're needing help. We don't show any appreciation until, until, until we're actually beginning to drown and we need the lifeguard. God wants to step in and be our safe place. It literally says in Psalm 52, or 55, verse 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. Not I shall sustain myself, he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. I want to share a quick story with y'all. So the summer after my soft, or the summer of my sophomore year, uh, I went through one of, the, one of the most difficult times of my life. I went through one of those challenging seasons of life. And I lived in Florida for about eight years. And for that first seven it was super difficult. I, I, was, I struggled with a lot of loneliness, but like I never had any friends. And then I finally make friends. And then God was like, hey, Seth, those really aren't good friends. I'm like, God, you're right. And, and so then I separate from those friends. And then I get to my sophomore year. I, you know, I head back into loneliness, but then I get to my sophomore year. It's been seven years of struggling, asking God, God, what are you going to do about this? Well, then God shows up. If, at least that's what it felt like. God shows up and he, and he provides these friends for me. And I'm just so thankful, my God, thank you. Finally, you're giving me what I've been asking for. Finally, you're showing up. Well, then fast forward to November, you know, August, September, October, I almost forgot October, uh, to November. My parents were sitting on the back porch and, and we're having this conversation. We're just, we're just chopping it up, you know, like normal laughing, having fun, enjoying ourselves. And then my dad, he... Uh, <laughs> He looks at me, my parents, granted my parents, they, they knew about all this. They knew how much I struggled with this. And, and he looks at me and he makes this face that only my dad makes when something hard has to be shared. He just looks at me and goes, hey buddy, I've got something I need to share with you. And I was like, yeah, dad, what is it? He said, there's a really strong chance, uh, you know, and I know how, much, how hard it's been, but there's a really strong chance that we're moving to Houston. And I just, I, 
I was devastated. I mean, I'm going, God, how can you do this? I just begin crying and crying. And I honestly thought he was joking because he was wearing a University of Texas jacket. And so I'm thinking like, like oh, this is a Texas joke. Like, like Dad, that's really funny. And, and I'm just waiting for the, for the punch and the punch that never comes. Like, I'm just crying, sitting going, God, how can you do this? Parents, how can you do this? Like, like you know how hard it's been for me. You know how much I've struggled with this. How can you do this to me? And then I call my brother and I'm on the phone and I'm just crying still and crying. And then I go to my room and, and I've got the song Unsteady by Ex Ambassadors playing on repeat because I was just, I didn't know what else to listen to. And I'm just, I'm crying and I'm crying and I'm crying. Asking God all the questions. God, how could you do this? God, what is it? Like, I'm going to leave all the things I know to head into more unknown. And, and what, like, what, what do I get what I want? When are the storms going to stop coming? fall asleep that night, you know, just, I don't remember what time it was, but I fall asleep, just super, and then I wake up just super heavy hearted, just knowing like, man, I, my life's gonna change. I don't know what's gonna happen. I was told like, hey, we can't, we can't share this for a long time. So it wasn't until March that I was actually able to talk about this with anyone. But that morning I get a text from my student pastor and he's never sent me his quiet time, never before this and never after this, but on the morning after, this is what he sends me, which of course God just does this. Matthew 6, 25 through 30. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And this is the part that got me. Are you not much more valuable than they? Are you not much more valuable than they? God just... Church, it was just this moment where I just sat there on the edge of my bed. I just, I was reading this verse. And it was just this moment where I felt like Jesus just entered in. This moment where I'm sitting there on the edge of my bed, sitting there going, God, I don't know what's next. God, I don't know what you have for me. And yet he just, he sits there on the bed and he just puts my arm, he puts his arm around my shoulder. He said, Seth, I know. I know you don't know. I know you don't know what's on the other side, but I need you to obey me. I need you to be faithful and just watch what I'm gonna do. And I said, God, this is scary. God, I don't know what's gonna happen. Like, like I don't know the aftermath of this storm, the damages that's gonna be done. And he said, I know. He said, Seth, I need you to let me, this, allow me to step in. Allow me to be your comforter. Allow me to fill that gap for you. He said, but Seth, you've gotta let me in. I'm not gonna force my way in. You've gotta let me in. So I sat there and I remember getting in the car with my dad and, and he's asking me about how I'm feeling. I was like, dad, I, I can't even explain this, but this is kind of what I just received. And, and dad, I just know God is telling me like, hey, if you feel that it's best to move it, then we need to move. But the next few months weren't easy. It was still a storm. I still had to walk through it. I still had to, had to go through it. It was still super difficult. I still wasn't able to tell anyone about it. I still struggled. I still, I still was having a difficult time with it, but God was, but hey, guess what? God was with me because he was my safe place. He didn't say, Seth, you know what? You're not going to Houston. You're gonna stay here. You know what? I saw how hard that night was for you. Like, you know what? Never mind. I'm backing off. No, he said, Seth, I know it's hard. Let me step in. For me, it was, it was moving to a different state. That was my storm. Maybe for you, your literal storm is the storm that came through and now you're having to deal with the repercussions of that storm. Maybe for you, it's your family. You just don't know what to do. You're trying as a parent, you're trying as a kid and you're, you're trying to be obedient to God and to your parents. You're trying to be obedient to God and, and understand your kids, but you just don't know what to do. These storms are gonna keep coming. And this morning, this morning, church, I just, Jesus doesn't remove us, but he steps in with us. He steps into the midst of that, but he can't be the safe place until we let him in. And this morning, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus, that can't be true. So this morning, if you are ready to acknowledge, God, I'm not enough and I'll never be enough. I can't brave the storms by myself. 
We have to acknowledge that we'll never be able to bridge the gap between us and heaven. We have to acknowledge that our sin is what we do, is why we deserve death. And that's why Jesus went to the cross. And we have to choose to accept that Jesus is the son of God and that he saved my life. We have to want to accept that he saved my life. He stepped in my place. And if you're wanting Jesus to be your safe place for the very first time, this morning is the time to do it, church. This morning is the time to let Jesus in. And maybe you've already let Jesus in. That's awesome. That is amazing that you've let Jesus into your life and he is your savior, but you still are trying to do it on your own. You're still trying to brave the storm by yourself. You're still trying to figure it all out by yourself. You don't wanna invite community and you don't wanna to go to the word of God because that takes 30 minutes and I don't even have 30 minutes because I'm busy fixing everything else in my life. We've gotta be prepared for the storms. We've gotta allow God to step in. And maybe it's time for you to do some prep work. Maybe it's some time for you to begin your preparations. Maybe you're not in a storm right now. Praise God. But it doesn't mean we just, we, we sit there and don't do anything. It doesn't mean we become complacent. Maybe we gotta help others through their storms. But what an opportunity for you to not wait until you can breathe again out of your nose, but begin to be grateful now. God, thank you for not having me in a storm. Thank you. Church, we gotta be prepared for the storms and allow our storms to become the stories of God's goodness that we get to share with those around us. Our prayer partners are gonna come forward. And if you, need, if you need prayer this morning, just for everything that's been going on, please come and seek prayer. But we can't wait until the storm has passed. We need to go now. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day, God. Thank you so much just for the opportunity to be here this morning. God, I thank you for giving me the chance to share just what you're doing in my life. God, and I pray that just everything that's been going on, Lord, that you would just put your hedge of protection over this church. God, for those that have faced severe damages, Lord, that are still without power, God, that we would rally as a community, that we would surround each other with community, a community that's inescapable. God, I pray that we would do the preparations, God, that we would be digging into your word and that it would be on our hearts. So God, that when the storms come, we know who we trust and we know who we rely on. We know whose I am, God. We know that we're a friend of yours, God. You don't leave your friends abandoned. God, I pray that, that we would know deliverance does not mean that you remove us, but you actually did deliverance on the cross for us. God, would you step into our midst? God, would we allow you and would we open our hearts to what you're gonna do? God, we thank you so much and we love you. And it's your son's name I pray, amen. Thank you.